Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Baines. I'm the leader of St Helens Borough Council. Welcome to this meeting of the Cabinet. Just before we begin uh, this afternoon's meeting, I just want to thank and pay tribute to our public sector workers. Um, we've all seen rates of uh, COVID increasing in recent weeks, and I want to thank them, including, of course, our amazing council staff for their tireless hard work and dedication. Uh, in particular, I want to thank all those working in our schools in extremely challenging circumstances. OK, I'm now going to ask members of the Cabinet to introduce themselves so we know who's here for the benefit of those watching. Uh, Councillor Bowden. OK, thank you, Chair. Um, my name's uh, Andy Bowden. I represent the Power Ward and I'm Cabinet Member for Envi uh, Environment and Highways. Thank you. Councillor Burns. Thank you, uh, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Councillor Anthony Burns, representing Haydock Ward, and I'm the Cabinet Member for Public Health, Leisure, Libraries, Arts and Heritage. Thank you. Councillor Bell. Good afternoon, Councillor Jeannie Bell, Cabinet Member for Safer, Stronger Communities. Councillor Grocutt. Good afternoon, I'm Kate Grocutt, Councillor for Par Ward and Cabinet Member for Education, Skills and Business. Councillor Quinn. Good afternoon, Marlene Quinn representing West Park Ward, Cabinet Member for uh, Health and Adult Social Care. Councillor Bond. I'm Martin Bond, I'm Councillor for Haydock and I'm the Cabinet Member for Finance and Governance. Councillor Charlton. Nova Charlton, Councillor for Fatto Heath Ward and Cabinet Member for Children and Young People. Councillor Macaulay. Uh, thanks, Leader. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Councillor Richard McCauley, Thatcher Heath Ward Councillor and Cabinet Member for Regeneration and Planning. And last but not least, Councillor Gomez Aspron. Hello, I'm Seb Gomez Aspron. I represent Newton the Willows and Deputy Leader of the Council and Cabinet Member for Reset and Recovery. Thank you very much, everyone. Item one is apologies for absence. I've, I've received none. Item two is the minutes of the meeting from the 23rd of September, just two weeks ago. Are they agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank agreed. you. Three, three is declarations of interest. And four is the financial monitoring report. Councillor Bond. Thanks, Chair. This report says the second financial monitoring report for the current municipal financial year, and it covers the period July to September 2020. It follows the standard reporting format. The reporting annexes A to G provides further details of the situation. Uh, it sets out the council's business as usual position for the 2020-2021 budget in that the additional pressures arising from COVID-19 are reported in the budget strategy report further down the agenda. Section one summary revenue budget. This details current portfolio position on a business as usual variance against a budget of 1.45 million. This is an increase of 0.9 million since the previous financial monitoring report, which went to cabinet on the 24th of June. The portfolio position is offset by a favourable variation, 0.28 million, in council wide budgets, and the resulting forecast position is plus 1.626 million variance against budget. I want to highlight some of the most significant reported budget pressures in a couple of departments. In the adult social care and health portfolio, a pressure of 0.7 million arises. The Cabinet will note a pressure in learning disability services projected at 1.5 million. This is offset by underspends, particularly across physical and memory cognition services. Also, in the environmental services portfolio, a pressure of 0.4 million, primarily relating to the waste collection recycling service. 
Annex A provides further details on the portfolio forecast outturn against budget. I'm mindful that when Cabinet set the 2020-21 budget, it reset a number of baseline budgets. This was done primarily to recognise both increased demand-led pressures, particularly in social care, and specific pressures in some income generating areas. In other words, both the portfolio areas I've just referenced. Additionally, in that budget, a 5 million contribution from earmarked reserves was approved. Now, based on the current forecast, the projected general fund balance is a 7.7 .7 million at the end of the financial year. This assumes that the cost of the council's financial exposure to COVID-19 is fully met through government funding, a promise which the government has made but has not delivered upon. Section two is the implementation of the savings proposals agreed for 2020-2021. I've already mentioned as part of the budget setting process for this year, a five million contribution from reserves is accounted for. In addition, <clears throat> portfolio savings of five million pounds were agreed to arrive at the statutory obligation of the authority having a balanced budget position. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, 64% of savings are expected to be achieved this year. Credit must go for this to officers and portfolio holders for driving these savings. However, in some areas, COVID-19 is impacting on the delivery of the savings. It's currently forecast that 1.4 million of agreed savings cannot be delivered during the year and a further 0.3 million is at risk of not being delivered if plans cannot be implemented during the reset and recovery period. Portfolios have been instructed to identify and implement alternative savings to mitigate those at risk in 2020 to 2021. Section 3 is the capital programme um, and it summarises section 3 and the next D provides the individual scheme details. A number of new schemes have been included in the programme the most significant being the relocation of Penkford Special School, which Cabinet discussed at its last meeting. The programme also shows additional funding from the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority in relation to the Highways programme and a million pounds accelerated town deal funding for the demolition of Shallon Way car park. Scheme costs have been reprofiled in relation to the A49 to M6 Junction 22 link road, the Parkside project, but the overall cost of that scheme remains unchanged. Section four, reserves and balances. The council's position regarding earmark balances at the end of the year is provided at section 4.2 and Annex F provides further details through to the end of 23. Annex C provides details of approved use of earmark reserves during the period and the council position regarding capital receipts are detailed in the report. Section five, other financial monitoring issues. Uh, there's some narrative within that in respect of other matters, including the acceptance of a million pounds from the City Region Revenue Funding to support the recovery of Earls Town and Telling Town Centres post COVID-19 and the projected pressure on the dedicated skills grant for 2020-2021. Don't normally talk about the DSG, but I'll just mention it here that when a local authority has a substantial in-year overspend or cumulative DSG deficit balance at the end of the financial year, it's required to submit a recovery plan to the Department for Education and that should bring the overall DSG account into balance in a timely period. Section six, the Treasury Management Update, <clears throat> which details the, the Council's borrowing and investment position as per usual, that's an XG. Um, that is impacted by, by interest rates at the moment, uh, and that's something that we should take note of. Uh, that concludes what, all I've got to say on this particular report, and I move, I move it formally, and I'm happy for colleagues to comment or raise any questions. Thank you, Councillor Bond. I've got Councillor Quinn who'd like to speak. Yeah, um, thank you, Leader, and thank you, Councillor Bond, on the report that you've given. Um, yes, adult social care um, faces some very, very challenging times ahead of us. Um, we've got to make some decisions, but we have legislative um guidance what we can and we can't do what we must do uh the care act 2014 st helens has always provided the best of care and support for its most vulnerable and we want and will continue to do this what i would say is without integration we would have been in a right big mess going into COVID. Our integration, our partnership working, our models that we'd set out, be it Kershaw record, 
Arts and Talents course. Um, our integration with funding, continuing health and better care fund really helped us at the most dreadful of times. Councils and governments are saying the worst in a hundred years. And yes, it was. So I'd like to compliment all elected members and all officers, be it CCG and the local authority, that really drove the integration forward. And just to say, without it, many, many more people in our borough would sadly have either missed out on services or sadly passed away. Whilst we've had quite a few deaths within our homes, we've had far less than our neighbours around us. Our partnership working with our care homes and residential homes was second to none. I've also got to thank our carers living at home, providing care to their loved one in their homes, because without all of our carers, the task that we faced would not have been met in the way it was. As we go forward, it could get even worse, but I'm sure that everyone continuing to work as we have done will see us through it. Um, and we, we must face whatever we have to face together, united to take our borough forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quinn. Councillor gomez Asprom. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just to make a few points, really, on uh, the report. It's, it's a really interesting read. And one of the first things we noticed is that the actual benefits we're getting out of being in a city region be under no illusion <coughs> that some of these consequences would be worse and harder felt if we weren't in that city region organisation. And I know that it's sometimes uh, a link that the public struggle to get their head round or to see what that link actually is and it's even worse when the press report it as Liverpool and not Liverpool City Region but we are seeing uh, tangible benefits from being part of that structure. Uh, it was interesting I've just googled it quick to see when it was said so Rishi Sunak promised everything it takes on the 18th of March when this pandemic really started to kick off and then by the 14th of April which was less than a month already started wavering on the promises that he'd made to local government to plug that gap. So within four weeks of saying that they would do it, uh, they started to renege on that, which uh, just sums up uh, the government, really. Uh, there's an interesting line from the opposition in that we should be using capital receipts to offset budget cuts. And it's essentially like giving up your job and using your life savings. It isn't sustainable. It doesn't work. You can only use capital once and we need to use it to do those transformative projects that the public ask for. Uh, in order to spin new revenue streams going forward. Uh, and the only real picture I'd want to paint is because of the government not living up to their promises on giving us the funding that they said we'd need for going through this crisis, we have to make in the next 12 months more cuts than we've made in the last three years because there have been government cuts to council funding. So it's just to set that picture, councils will look very different in 12 months. It's entirely because of the situation the government have created by not bridging the gap that they promised us they would on the 18th of March, and then within four weeks decided they didn't want to do it anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Okay, is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Item five is budget strategy, uh, continuing that theme. Councillor Bond. Thanks, Chair. I don't want to cover too much the same ground as before, but it obviously informs this report. Um, and and Councillor Gomez has well touched on some of the elements that, that are in this report of the strategy going forward. So the last report detailed where we're up to at the end of September. This deals with the rest of the year and going into the next year. So it's a <clears throat> the report is an update and summary of the financial position of the council in relation to its revenue budget um, for next year. 
I mean, a recommendation is necessary to enable the setting of a balanced budget, which is a statutory requirement, which again I mentioned previously. It also recognises the significant uncertainties that exist for next year. As I set out in the previous, uh, previous agenda item, Council has a one year budget for this year and the in year challenges are detailed in the previous item and the comments I made earlier. It should be noted that that budget acknowledges that the use of reserves is not sustainable and would need to be addressed in future years. The financial environment at the time before COVID hit was very challenging anyway. Um, it's created significant additional uncertainty and challenges. So in section 4.1 of the report, there is a table which shows a £3.2 million deficit position for the current financial year, COVID related. And the budget gap and modelling principles which have been used are, 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 are reflected in that report, in that, that table, sorry. Um, it's materially uncertain due to the ongoing impacts of COVID-19 and the lack of clarity around the future funding of local government. The significant uncertainty impacts upon a number of areas that are used to build up the future financial forecast, particularly in relation to council tax and business rates. The estimated impacts of future income losses and expenditure pressures have been built into this model. The level of government funding for next year is also uncertain and will only be known following the comprehensive spending review and local government settlement that will follow. And the model here assumes general funding support will continue as at the present level as will social care support via the social care support grant, better care fund and improved better care fund, etc. Government has announced further delays to the fair funding review and reforms to the business rates retention system until 2022 at the earliest. The model assumes that the council will continue to retain 99% of its business rates under the Liverpool City Region business rates retention scheme and an annual increase in council tax of 1.99% plus an adult social care precepts of 2%. So the projection for next year, when taking into account the aforementioned assumptions and in the absence of any COVID-19 government support, is detailed in the table at section 4.2 on page 69 of the agenda. And it shows a forecast deficit for next year of £20.4 million. That's a hugely significant sum within, within the budget, in excess of 10% of the budget. So the protections factor no further use of general or EMAT reserves within that figure. There's even greater uncertainty for future years with further delays to the introduction of the fair funding review, the redesign of business rates, we don't know what that's going to mean, uh, future funding plans for social care with, again in the last 24 hours that's been promised, lots of promises made, which doesn't seem to appear, I'm sure Councillor Quinn will say something about that. Um, so the economic impact as well of Covid and the uh, exit from the European Union will have to be factored in. So it's intended that a new medium term financial strategy will be presented to Budget Council in 2021 to set out the risks and assumptions and future year budget forecasts. So the Council, along with our colleagues in the city region, will continue to lobby government to provide a first settlement to deflect the extra financial burden which local authorities have been placed under. Alongside the LCR partner authorities, a significant number of asks have been taken forward directly with MHCLG that could provide some easing of the pressures. So for the savings that will be required for next year, proposals are now being developed to address the current forecast budget and the deficit of 20.4 million. A review of all services will need to be undertaken to identify efficiencies and reduce overall costs. These reviews may suggest a cessation or radical reduction of some discretionary services or moving to minimum levels of statutory services. That gives me no pleasure. We are in no different position to authorities across the older industrial areas of the UK and in conjunction with our fellow city region authorities are lobbying MH MHCLG hard to assist in mitigating the serious effects of what is now a second wave. A second wave running the back of the first wave and the 10 years of swinging funding cuts that went before it. The projections do not and at this stage cannot assess the impact of the current wave. The situation is grave for local government across the country. We will emerge from the pandemic into a different world, that's for sure. The way all public services do business will not be the same as it was before. And this is the most difficult time for local government in metropolitan areas since 1974. The financial challenge is vast. Radical ways of working and delivering services will be at the heart of the strategy, but this authority, whilst Labour led, will always place our most vulnerable residents first when assessing its budgets. We will ask our fellow residents to adapt to the new world that we will face 
flexibly and compassionately. We all live in the borough and we all want the best for our borough. And in closing, I want to be crystal clear that the responsibility for potential service reduction and potential cuts lies with the Tories. The clear promise that Councillor Gorman has asked for mentioned before to local government has been reneged upon and we are left to carry the can. I move the report. Thank you, Councillor Bond, and I second everything you've just said. I've got Councillor Quinn. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Um, this report as well uh, sets out very, very stark um, changes that we're going to have to adapt to. What I would say is I find it very hard to um, visualise reset and recovery that all organisations have got teams working on as we move forward when we've got a government that doesn't even tell us what funding we're going to get, doesn't meet funding promises it made, and also the growing demand that COVID has thrown on us. So I don't know whether members really think about it as reset and recovery, or are we in a guessing game? We can put things down, what we'd like to do, what we think, but we've got a government that doesn't keep promises, it makes remarks, says it's going to give us something and doesn't deliver. For an example, changes to social care funding and the green paper and the white paper. I've said before that paper's gone mouldy and it's time now that we got more than lip service from the government. Yesterday, the Prime Minister said uh, we're going to look at a Churchill style of funding, like a national insurance. Well, I hope that when this pandemic does leave us, there's enough people in employment to be able to pay into that scheme, whatever it is. Because the way the government is handling the management of the pandemic locally for local government isn't helping us at all. On top of those broken promises, yes, we have 20 million to save or to cut, whatever way you want to look at it, cut from the government. We have to say we are looking for the best ways to get that money. And it will take a hundred percent effort from everyone, be it our communities, be it our service users, be it our partner organisations, a hundred percent commitment. Otherwise, I fear, I really fear for our most vulnerable. If I look at the two most um, areas of challenge, challenge, they're all challenged, but the two most coming under fierce, fierce amounts to save are our most vulnerable. I look at our children's services, I look at our adult services, and then I look at the demand that has arisen through the pandemic in those two areas. I then look at our safer communities, the demand on the domestic abuse, the demand on the homelessness, all of our services deliver services that our public need, not what they, they, they'd like to think, oh, I'd like that. They need them and we have a duty to provide those services for those individuals in need. So I hope going forward, all partners and our community will work with us to face this difficulty. Thank you, Chair. 
Thanks, Councillor Quinn. Are there any further questions or comments? OK, um, for the for those watching or anyone uh, reading um, the papers and look at the papers online, section 4.4 is uh, is the really important one. It sets out the budget gap we face and, and what uh, ourselves and officers are having to look at as a result of this budget gap. Um, in, in recent weeks, uh, I've held a, a briefing with opposition group leaders to bring them up to speed on, on the situation. And I'm, I'm grateful for the, uh, the offer so far of, of support. Uh, we wrote together jointly all political groups in April to government asking for uh, financial help. We haven't had a reply uh, some five months later, which is disappointing to say the least. Uh, the government did say, um, as it was pointed out earlier, that they would do whatever it takes. They told us to do whatever it takes and we have, and they said they would do whatever it takes and they haven't. Um, I'm grateful to the support of MPs, Connor McGinn and Mary Rimmer, who are lobbying hard for us in Westminster. I'm grateful to the support of our colleagues in the city region um, and we're working together, Labour, locally to support businesses, to support residents and to keep essential services running as best as we can. And we'll continue to do that. But we, uh, while we're doing our bit, we need government to do theirs. Is that report agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Item six is green home strategy. Councillor Bell. Thank you. So the report in front of you is an example of the work that we're trying to undertake to support residents in any way that we can during this really difficult period um, and in extremely uncertain financial circumstances. The report in front of you provides an overview of the measures contained in the Green Homes Grant Scheme that was announced in July 2020. It identifies proposals on how the council will promote the scheme to maximise opportunities for residents and local businesses to benefit from it. So the aim of the scheme is to reduce carbon emissions from domestic housing by providing funding for energy efficiency measures, which at the same time are going to help reduce fuel poverty and improve health and create jobs in the green economy. So there's two elements to the grant scheme. Um, there'll be one and a half billion, which is made available directly to households themselves and landlords in some cases through a voucher scheme. And the remaining 500 million is going to be made available to local authorities in 2020, 2021 and through to 2022 uh, via a bidding process. Uh, and that's going to be part of the local authority delivery programme. Under the voucher scheme, low income owner occupied households can qualify for vouchers of up to 10,000 and won't be required to make any contribution to the costs of the energy efficiency works. Vouchers up to 5,000 will be made available for other households and landlords on the basis that they are required to contribute a third of the costs of those works. The local authority delivery programme covers the same measures, but it's intended to be delivered directly at a local level by local authorities, but we're required to bid for that process. Both the voucher and the local authority delivery schemes will fund the installation of primary and secondary measures and primary measures include things like insulation, low carbon heating. Secondary measures include things like window replacement and heating controls. There's obviously a lot more detail in the report. Um, what's, what we're hoping is going to be quite exciting news is that in respect to the scheme, an area of former coal board housing in PAR has been identified for a future funding bid. The properties in that area are solid wall construction and have really poor energy efficiency. So they're ideal for an area based solid wall insulation programme where householders are likely to meet the income um, eligibility criteria. We're working with a registered housing provider who's got stock in that area and they're really keen to work with the council to undertake the works during 2021 and 2022 and we're hoping that that's going to act as a catalyst for owner occupiers and private sector landlords to also get involved. Um, further work will be undertaken between the council and that registered housing provider to develop that bid to access the local authority delivery funding. And you know, we're really going to be pushing for that because it's anticipated that if we're successful, over 50 homes in power would benefit from solid wall insulation through the scheme. The scheme complements the work that we do every year around our winter warmer campaigns to tackle fuel poverty. The sad fact is that according to the government statistics which are published this year, 
in 2018, 10.3% of households in England, so approximately 2.4 million, were classed as in fuel poverty, and that was only projected to rise in 2019. And there are currently no projected fuel poverty figures for 2020 due to COVID. Essentially, we just don't know what is likely to happen to household incomes between April 2020 and March 2021, and that could increase fuel poverty significantly, especially when you consider that more people are working from home, there's going to be more use in the household of the energy. Um, and also there are additional pressures such as the potential and anticipated removal of additional universal credit payments, which have been a lifeline for many families during lockdown um, and that we really need to push and, and we will be vocal about keeping those in place. There is no doubt we've got a really long, difficult period ahead. And if you're struggling with fuel payments or to keep your house warm, please, please seek support and advice. The winter warmth information packs are going to be available soon. And in there are a range of support measures that you can access and contact numbers if you need help or advice. We want residents to be warm and safe through the winter period because it's dangerous if they're not. It's dangerous to their health. And I'd really encourage all residents to apply for this grant as quickly as possible and to get in touch if you need help or advice. I also want to ask our local tradespeople and businesses who are appropriately certified to install energy efficient or low carbon heating improvements to register with Trustmark at www.trustmark.org.uk so that they can play a part in carrying out work under that scheme because it would be great for this scheme to provide additional work and jobs in our own community. So today I'm asking Cabinet to approve the proposed approach to promoting the Green Homes Grant Voucher Scheme and approve the proposed approach to the Green Homes Grant Local Authority Delivery Scheme using the existing delivery mechanisms to maximise outputs in the second phase 21 to 22. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Uh, excellent report. Can I bring in Councillor gomez Aspron, please? Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, Jeannie summed it up really well there, I think. Uh, we need to, if we're going to want to be serious about reducing the carbon footprint in the borough, then that goes well beyond the, what the council controls or owns. And it goes well into uh, housing estates and people's residential properties. So it's great to see that we're not only doing that uh, for the right reasons, but targeting those who might be most susceptible to fuel poverty and doing it in the right areas as well. So I know from when we did a scheme uh, previously on the Trees Estate in Newton that power will benefit massively from that because as people spend more time at home going into winter, either through whatever might become the next of a lockdown or working from home, fuel bills get expensive because you spend a lot more time at home than you, than you would usually be at work. So it's fantastic stuff. It's interesting because the government cut tariffs drastically for selling energy back to the grid, which was massively short sighted and hindered loads of progress that anyone was making with putting solar and uh, especially onshore wind was the, the biggest one here. So these schemes administered locally mean that we can start making some of that stack up financially and give the people who need the savings uh, the, the best opportunities to be delivered. What I think it also needs to show is that we need to start looking at this as a council now, not through this grant scheme, uh, but our own estates. And uh, we, we've spoken to officers now about how we start going forward doing that. Whether that's on site or off site, we can make a commitment to going forward to reduce our uh, energy output and our carbon footprint. And then that starts to put the jigsaw together to cover all those areas where residential council estates and the wider borough. Uh, and we're happy to take the lead on that. So we're, we're happy to start doing that. And hopefully we can have some progress to report soon. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Is that agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Councillor Bell. Item seven is exclusion of the public. Uh, is that agreed? Agreed. agreed? agreed. Thank you. We'll now move to the private agenda.